He's also written Wheat Belly Total Health, two cookbooks, Wheat Belly 10 Day Grain Detox, and his books have sold millions of copies in North America in North America and have been published in over 40 countries. More than a book, social media, even the wheat belly phenomena has proven to be a movement growing over time and creating an audience eager for food solutions that are healthy, delicious, convenient, and consistent with the wheat belly message. And so now he has a new book out and it's called Undoctored, which I read prior to the conference. And it is an unbelievable book, which gives you so much insight into how broken the healthcare system really is, while at the same time empowering you to become your own doctor, which is one of the main themes of this event, giving you the confidence through knowledge and experience to have correct discernment in terms of what's best for you and your body, you need to be the authority on you. And he gives many strategies on how to do that as well as gives you the confidence to do it. It's a must read in my opinion and a book that everyone should have in their health library. So he takes the lessons he learned through the whole worldwide wheat belly phenomena and experience and adds new concepts including how to harness the emerging power of crowdsourced wisdom because at this event we are the internet right now. We are the internet and new technological health tools. Please, if we could all get to our feet and give Dr. William Davis a wonderful Longevity Now conference. Welcome, Dr. William Davis. Hello, everybody. Uh, now, this is a pretty savvy crew, so I, I changed my usual talk because I know if I went through some of the things I say, you might say, I know all that stuff. So I want to give you some really just two new ideas. You know, I bet your attention's kind of being taxed by now. It's late afternoon. Uh, so I have really two messages for you uh, that I think could change the way you feel, look, Etc. And because this is a longevity conference, I, I tailored this towards age reversing, youth preserving. So I got some good stuff for you. So, but I do want to emphasize that this occurs on the background of the basic principles in my crazy books that earned me a lot of criticism and rotten apples and so on. Uh, the full program is articulated in the Wheat Belly Total Health book and the Undoctored book. The Undoctored book, as Rebecca points out, expands the notion of crowdsourcing, of wisdom, of collaborating. Isn't that what we're doing? How many, how many of you have sat in the doctor's office and you feel like, well, gee, I know more than the doctor does about health, nutrition, and supplements? I mean, it's... 20 years ago, you would have been the exception. Today, you're becoming the rule. So it tells us, it's symptomatic of a very desperately flawed medical system, right? So Undoctored takes that message a little further. I'm, what I'm trying to do is do what you guys are doing, and that is to collaborate. You know, I'm always impressed how much a school teacher knows about health, or an engineer, or a supplement manufacturer, or a salesman. People have their own little unique expertise, little knowledge, experience, and we fold it all together, and wonderful things happen. But I will not be talking about my programs. <laughs> so, um, but just quickly, for those of you not unfamiliar with my stuff, so you've been hearing some very lofty levels of conversation from people like David Wolf and Dr. Stephen Gundry. My program, the basic program, is not quite so fancy. It's just a basic program. But if you do this basic program, a lot of stuff goes away. So it's basic, and by now you've probably heard a lot of this already. No, no wheat, no grains, no sugars. I think you're, most of you are pretty solid on that already. Remember, grains are seeds of grasses, as Dr. Gundry pointed out, and humans simply don't have the digestive machinery 
to break down the seeds of grass. It's not the roots, not the stalks, not the husk, and not the seeds. But people often don't realize that the ciabatta or bagel you had in January can generate rheumatoid arthritis by September. Okay, so it may not be an immediate cause effect. It could be, but it can also be a very delayed effect. So when humans first turned to the seeds of grasses for sustenance, they didn't know 10,000 years ago that they'd pay a health price down the road. And now we have this situation where agribusiness has amplified, exaggerated the problems in wheat and grains as the glyphosate residues, GMO, uh, lectins, and all the other issues surrounding grains, gliden-derived opioid peptides, right, that stimulate appetite and cause mind fog. So that collection of problems in wheat and grains, we simply undo by eliminating wheat and grains, the food most celebrated by all nutritional authorities, including the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health and Human Services, and the USDA, and the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, all agree you should all eat every day, every meal, every snack, healthy whole grains. So I think most of you understand that argument by now. Whoops. Vitamin D. I've not been quite as aggressive as Dr. Gundry, but uh, I come from Wisconsin. I, I come from New Jersey, but I work in Wisconsin now, where that climate is very sun-deprived, right? And when you give that population vitamin D, spectacular things happen. Now, even more so, combine vitamin D with wheat and grain elimination, even bigger things happen. So vitamin D, at the top of your list for things to get absolutely right, I aim for a more modest level based on such observations as the Maasai and other uh, uh, populations that live wild tend to have blood levels no higher than 50. Not as low as we do, certainly not as low as in Wisconsin or Chicago where I see people with five or seven nanograms per milliliter. But aiming for 60 to 70, you know, if you're a young uh, lifeguard wearing a skimpy bathing suit in Miami, what will your, you're young, what will your 25 hydroxy vitamin D blood level be? 80, 86, 90, okay? So I take that to mean if, if a kid can achieve it, it must be tolerable, physiological, and normal. So I compromise with this, this range. But regardless, we could argue about the details, but that alone is a big, big factor. Fish oils become kind of boring, right? But don't forget, omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, are among the most important things you can do. There's a bunch of malarkey about how to prevent dementia. There's a ton of nonsense out there. We're going to, we're going to touch on that. But one thing you can do that has been confidently shown to prevent cognitive impairment is fish oil. It's the mortar in your brain. The DHA in fish oil, more so than the EPA, is, the, is a very crucial component of brain tissue. So we get a lot of fish oil. Set, you know, we should go back to the way things used to be done, which is eat fish. But in this modern age, we've got mercury exposure, right? Other things. You got, so, Fish oil is kind of our modern, safe workaround for that. Magnesium. Because you drink filtered water, you must, right? You can't. I'd love to go to the river and drink water, but what's in that? What's sewage runoff, pesticide, herbicide, farm, right? All kind of nonsense. So we have to filter our water, and water filtration is very effective at removing all magnesium. Modern crops, you've heard this before, are reduced in magnesium content. And if you ate grains in the past, 60 to 70% of all magnesium in your diet was bound and you pooped it out from the phytates in grains. So we all start this basic process with profound magnesium deficiency. It can show as higher blood sugars, higher blood pressures, muscle cramps, heart rhythm disorders, migraine headaches, and a variety of other factors. Now, by the way, if you're interested in, in replacing your magnesium, all of you should be, uh, see my uh, books and or I post on my Wheat Belly blog, my undoctored blog, the recipe for magnesium water. It's the best form of magnesium you can get. It's a quick reaction between carbonic acid, carbonated water, and milk of magnesia. Good old-fashioned, disgusting milk of magnesia, magnesium hydroxide. You do a quick reaction, you get magnesium bicarbonate and water. And it's the best magnesium you can't buy. Okay? It's the most highly absorbed, least laxative form. So if you've got migraines, if you have some magnesium responsive condition, consider using magnesium water. You can't buy it because magnesium bicarbonate as a powder is too hygroscopic, it's too water absorbent. 
You ever buy something as a powder, you open it, you don't look at it for a couple of weeks, come back, it's hard? That's what happens. So instead you make it yourself, and it's the best form of magnesium. You'll find that recipe in just about everything I've written. Uh, iodine and thyroid. I think it's kind of touched on by others, but I, you know, we forgot up until 1924, Iodine deficiency was a huge public health problem. 20% of kids had goiters and large thyroid glands. Uh, many more had iodine deficiency that hadn't yet shown up as a goiter. If you were a pregnant mom and you had a goiter, you had a 20% chance, 20% chance delivering a impaired, mentally impaired child. This was a huge public health problem because iodine's in the ocean. All the iodine on this planet is in the ocean. And the farther inland you go, the less iodine content there is in your food. What was figured out was lack of iodine. That's why iodized salt came to be. So the old motto on Morton's iodized salt, keep your family goiter free. Use more iodized salt, keep your family goiter free. That was their slogan. What F the FDA told us, use more salt, use more salt, use more salt. We did. What happened? Some people, some people proved to be salt sensitive, particularly if they eat a lot of grains. <laughs> and FDA said, quit it. What's wrong with you people using all that salt, even though it was their original advice to do so? So nice, health-conscious people, what do you do? You cut out the salt, right? You use very little. You use sea salt. You use artisanal salts and Himalayan sea salts with no iodine. So what's coming back? Iodine deficiency in goiters. It's so easy. Get your iodine kelp tablets, iodine drops. It's so darn easy. The other facet of this, that last item, though, is of all endocrine organs, the thyroid gland is the most susceptible to disruption. So I wouldn't be surprised 35% of us in this room have some form of thyroid dysfunction. It's very, very common. So you want to get that addressed, too. So that's a little bit more complicated, but getting your TSH 1.5 microunits or less, getting your free T3 into a desirable range, all that kind of stuff, that's all very important, too. And then cultivation of bowel floor. That's a big topic now. And I'm going to touch on one facet of, that's one of the points I want to make today, a very specific facet of bowel floor cultivation. Now, I won't fool you. Nobody knows what your bowel floor is supposed to look like. Nobody knows. Should it look like the Hadza in Tanzania? Should your poop look like the matzas in Peru? So those are two, two populations on different parts, of two, two continents, right? Hadza, Africa, Matzas, Peru, South America. Yet they have very different bowel floor from us, but very similar bowel floor to each other. That has caused some to propose that must be Stone Age bowel flora, right? Going back 100,000, 200,000, a million years. Does that mean you should have Matza bowel flora? Nobody knows, but it's a real... I hope some enterprising entrepreneur makes a, a, a probiotic maybe calls it ancient flora or something. And we, imagine we could take a probiotic capsule that mimics the bowel flora of one of those primitive... Somebody will do it, I think. And it'd be really cool to see what happens. But anyway, before we have that, cultivating bowel flora means removing things that disrupt bowel flora. Grains, sugars, chlorinated water, BT toxin, glyphosate, GMOs, right? All that stuff. I think of bowel flora as a garden. So pretend it's April, May, <laughs> June in Wisconsin, and you want to have a, a nice spring garden. Well, how do you do that? You pick the rocks out, the sticks, right? You turn the soil over, you prepare the soil. Then you plant seeds, cucumbers, right? Zucchini, whatever. And then you water and fertilize through the growing season. Well, your bowel floor is exactly the same. You prepare the soil, take away things that disrupt bowel flora, chlorinated water, grains and sugars, GMO foods, etc., herbicide, pesticides in your foods. You plant the seeds. That's where a high-potency, multi-species probiotic comes in, and lots and lots of enthusiastic use of fermented foods with lactobacillus and bifidobacteria and other species. And then you water and fertilize your bowel flora garden with prebiotic fibers. Okay, so that little, if, if you think of your bowel floor as a garden, it helps you remember all the different pieces. And they're all critical, by the way. It's critical you do all those things as we all collectively go through this journey of trying to decide what healthy bowel flora is supposed to look like. Okay? You put that all together. This is, most of you are pretty sophisticated people in health. 
This is a pretty basic list, right? I, I doubt I taught many of you all that much new here. But put this all together. Put these, by the way, all these factors serve intrinsic need. That's important. What if I meet you and you have big open sores on your back and on your legs, your joints are falling apart, you're in constant pain, you feel awful. The orthopedic surgeon says, you need two new knees and a new hip. The plastic surgeon says, you need extensive skin grafts. And you find out the whole problem was scurvy, lack of vitamin C, because you went on a long trip to need something that had vitamin C. In other words, if you correct intrinsic human need, extraordinary. So all you do is eat some oranges or take some vitamin C, whatever, and all those things go away. They reverse. In other words, if you, vitamin C is not part of this program, but it's just to il illustrate the power of serving intrinsic need. So each and every item here serves a human intrinsic need. Where did primitive humans get their omega-3 fatty acids from? Fish and shellfish. What if you weren't coastal? Where'd you get it from? Brains of land animals. <laughs> if, you were, <laughs> if, you were, if you weren't coastal, where'd you get your iodine from? Thyroid glands of the animals you killed. And you would know to share the thyroid gland to fight off goiter. Point being, everything here serves some intrinsic need you have. So ashwagandha, turmeric, great stuff, right? but they don't serve intrinsic needs, so your expectations should be lower, okay? Because there's no, anybody here with an ashwagandha deficiency? I'm not picking on ashwagandha, just to illustrate. It doesn't serve intrinsic need. So I drive home that point, because if you serve your body's intrinsic need, and then put them all together, some pretty incredible stuff happens. And there's a very powerful synergy that, emerges when you put this all, I, I, an effect I call two and two equals 11. You, you put all this stuff together and really incredible stuff happens. Whether you were labeled with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or type two diabetes or obesity or eczema or seborrhea or acid reflux or IBS or migraine headaches or plantar fasciitis, for the most part, it does not matter because you, you engage in this simple menu of strategies, and more than likely, you won't have those conditions after a few days, weeks, months. Okay, but my, my, I'm not here to talk about that, though. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I do want to emphasize that the basic efforts really do count. So these are just people I just took off my public Facebook page, young woman who I, I, I chose people because they illustrate the age-reversing effect. So I think this woman's in her early 50s. Looks pretty damn good, right? Early 50s? Uh, hard to make out in this kind of fuzzy picture, but can you see? Look at the neck. Before, after. Okay? Before, after. Look at the neck. A year between, this is doing back then the Wheat Belly program. Look at her eyes. She shaved 10 years off her life, didn't she? if not more, by reversing inflammation. People say, oh, that Davis guy is all about gluten, being gluten-free. No, 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 no. It's about a lot of things, but one of the crucial factors in this lifestyle is reversal of inflammation, reversing the factors that encourage inflammatory phenomena. Uh, here's a guy who uh, is no longer diabetic. I'm down 100 pounds, no more high blood pressure, no more dry skin, I feel great, I'll turn 50 in April, and I feel better than when I was 30. Who's, his name is Ron. Who's gonna live longer? Diabetic, 100 pound overweight, Ron? Or non-diabetic, having what, lost weight, Ron? Who's gonna live longer? Non-diabetic, non by a long stretch, right? And he won't have to worry about amputations, and kidney failure, and cataracts, and um, retinal disease, and heart disease, and stroke, all that stuff that type 2 diabetics get in an accelerated way. So what did he do for his life, his longevity, and his health, and his healthcare bills, by doing this? He got a ton, right? Another young lady, uh, you can't tell by her smiling face in the before picture, but she's nearly incapacitated by pains. You know what I'm talking about, these chronic pains that lots and lots of people get. Well, she does this program, and that's her recently. 
climbing rock walls at age 53. So she says, today is my 53rd birthday. I've never been worked so I'd get older. A year ago, I started 77 pounds heavier, chronically exhausted, brain lag depressed. Um, it's been an incredible year, and I've lost 77 pounds. Got myself in shape, started running, completed my first 5K. Um, my brain fog cleared up so much that I was awarded employee of the year by my company because my work improved so dramatically in such a short time. Depression and mood swings gone, energy level through the roof, cardiac symptoms gone. Just from the basic program. So at 53, she does this, and she's climbing a wall like a 23-year-old. That's what I'm seeing. There's this age-reversing, youth-preserving effect. That's the basic stuff. So, so I, I, I emphasize that because, to me, not doing the basics is like buying a fancy new car, right? You're so damn proud of it. You polish it. You, you clean the interior. You put new spark plugs. You, it's it's 40,000 miles in. It looks great. But you forgot to change the oil. What's going to happen to your engine? You're going to have a very pretty car that doesn't run, right? <laughs> or some imperfect analogy, but you get my point. You must address the basics. So to me, those, that simple list, that simple menu is just the basics. So let's go on and do some more fun stuff. So, <laughs> you guys know that in the past 50 years, we had this peculiar obsession with being clean, right? Hand sanitizer, antibacterial soap, make the kids wash their hands before they come in for dinner and all that sort of thing, right? And, I mean, there's a time when that's necessary. If you, go, if, if you have the misfortune of being in a hospital, which is a cesspool of, of pathogenic bacteria, right? Well, then you have to do those kinds of things. But it doesn't mean you should do that all the time. And this obsession with cleanliness has been taken to absurd uh, uh, degrees. So did you know, for instance, if you, if you use mouthwash, which is a very, very bad idea, by the way, your blood pressure goes up. It causes, mouthwash causes hypertension because in your effort to, to uh, kill bad organisms that cause bad breath, you've also killed good organisms. So this idea that we should be sterile, right? Sterile creatures with no bacteria on our skin, bowels, uh, vaginas, everywhere, is nonsense. We should be filled with bacteria, several pounds of bacteria. But most of all, in the bowels. We know there's several pounds of bacteria, you all know this, in the bowels. Uh, thousands of species, trillions in number. And I cringe to think that so many years, we used to think bowel flora was this annoying thing that when you f fiddled with it with antibiotics, it gave you diarrhea. End of story. Nothing more to know. And I cringe to think, because you may be seeing the headlines now, Parkinsonism is a disease of dysbiosis, of disrupted bowel flora to a large degree. Lou Gehrig's disease, type 2 diabetes. So many diseases are looking like one form or another of dysbiosis, disrupted bowel flora. Now, the effort to restore bowel flora is a broad one. So I, by this next conversation, I don't want to give the impression that there's a magic bullet for bowel flora. There's not. It's a, it's a kind of a concerted, comprehensive effort like, like your garden, right? You don't have a beautiful, bountiful garden in springtime just by throwing some seeds out and walking away. There's a whole effort. Likewise with bowel flora. But I, I remind you of that because I'm going to talk about a very specific species that I've been playing with. And this is, this is fairly new stuff. I've been doing this about two months. It's, it's fairly new because these data are fairly new. So there's a species of bowel flora and human flora called Lactobacillus reuteri. A guy named Reuter in Germany found it, so it's Lactobacillus reuteri. And it's proven there's lots of great organisms. David talked about Lactobacillus plantarum, right, as a great fermenting organism. It also has great effects in humans when you consume it and when it, when it's, when it proliferates in your bowels. But we've known for a number of years Lactobacillus reuteri does some really cool stuff. It reduces colic in babies and uh, uh, reflux, you know, heartburn. And by the way, this is bowel flora that we thought lived only in the colon, right? What's it doing exerting a reduction in esophageal reflux? So this idea that bowel flora is only in the colon is, is also wrong. You probably heard there's also airway flora. There may even be brain flora. So there's this new frontier of all this cool stuff coming out. 
uh, uh, l ruteri ruteri reduces H. pylori. So almost everybody here has H. pylori. But in most people, it doesn't cause ulcers and atrophic gastritis and those kinds of problems if it's kept at bay by healthy species. And one of those healthy species is Lactobacillus ruteri. It reduces, I'm sure some of you here, unfortunately, have had C. diff, Clostridium difficile enterocolitis. That's, that's, you take an antibiotic for whatever reason, sinusitis, skin infection, pneumonia, whatever, and you get this horrible, painful, bloody diarrhea, and it has to be treated with a whole course of antibiotics. It's very difficult. It's a horrible course. It doesn't always work. And if you don't treat, you die. It happens up to 3% of people who take antibiotics. Well, Lactobacillus ruteri is one of the species that helps keep that from occurring if you take it in the presence of another probiotic during a course of antibiotics. Uh, it reduces E. coli. We all have E. coli, right? But it helps suppress some of the undesirable species. In animal models, it reduces weight gain, reduces constipation. This is interesting. It increases vitamin D by about 25%. I don't know why, but that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, anybody here deal with a lot of SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? I know some of you do. Okay, so you know there's a form of SIBO called methanogenic SIBO or methanogenic IBS, right? These are, all this means is some people have an infection of their whole gastrointestinal tract, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It means it's ascended. Back, uh, species have ascended all the way up to the small bowel, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, etc. Uh, or people with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Some people have a lot of constipation with those conditions, about 10% of people. And that's because they have proliferation of what are called met met methane-producing species. And Lactobacillus ruteri is one of the species that fights that back. Okay? SIBO alone is a huge conversation. We can <laughs> talk about for an entire day. Um, but here I'm going to get into the meat of what I wanted to tell you. So I was playing around with some ideas in my head, I stumbled on a series of very, very exhaustive, elegant, detailed studies from MIT, of all things. It was a cancer group doing some research on Lactobacillus ruteri, and they, I don't even know what the original study was about, but they gave this probiotic in the water or as yogurt to these mice, and they noticed within a week the, the, the fur was, as they said, thick and luxuriant. <laughs> That's the, the one on top. That's a week. Something happened to their fur within a week of taking this one probiotic species. They started to study this systematically. They looked at the skin. Now, a lot of you, I know ladies are mostly uh, interested in skin. So a lot of you take collagen, right? Collagen hydrolysates, gelatin. A lot of you probably make bone broths, soups from bones or will slow cook your, your tough cuts of meat or pressure cook them. And all that releases the collagen and collagen breakdown products, collagen peptides. And that's great for skin health. It increases dermal thickness, skin thickness, a little bit. If you do this for a year or more, you get a little bit of increase in skin thickness if you do that. So it's a great thing to do. It also helps regrow cartilage and increases the joint lubricant. So getting collagen in whatever form, Eating chicken, eating the skin, eating fish, eating the skin, bone broths, collagen hydrolysate, you can buy, whatever. I tell you all that, look at the skin thickness difference. Left side, control, no probiotic. Right side, we're talking about 35 to 50% increase in skin thickness and dermal thickness. Nothing, nothing does that. Nothing does that. Not collagen hydrolysates, nothing. That's what caught my eye. The magnitude of change. Now, this, these are mice, so don't get too excited. No, no mice in this Longevity Now conference, last I checked. But that alone, and look at the little graph on the right down there on the bottom. Number of hair follicles. It regrew hair. It regrew hair dramatically. Interestingly, I, I, I was talking to Dr. Gundry about this before, and he said he's actually seen this in a lot of his patients where he includes lactobacillus ruteri in some form. He's seeing hair regrowth. Now, they did something further. They inflicted skin wounds. This is, this is mouse data. They inflicted skin wounds because they wanted to see what happened to skin healing. Not because they were interested in skin healing, but because skin healing is a gauge of youth. You ever notice how kids heal much quicker than adults? 
much quicker than, say, retired people. So the younger, the more vigorous you are, the quicker you heal. So skin healing is interesting in and of itself, but it's being used as a surrogate, a gauge of youthfulness, vigor, okay, healing capacity elsewhere. So on the left are just mice living their lives, right? On the right, after lactobacillus roideri supplementation. Uh, you can't tell just by this, but there's a whole bunch more pink on the right side. Those are fibroblasts. Those are fibrin and structural connective tissue producing cells. There's a dramatic increase. This is day six. Day, this is not six months, it's not six years, it's not because of some fancy drug. It's by getting one species of lactobacillus. Dramatic increase in fibroblasts. That next one labeled C on the right uh, is stained for collagen. Look at the, um, the little, gr little um, graphs. Very little collagen control, huge, magnificent increase in collagen. Far more, multiples, exponentially more than you'd get with collagen hydrolysates or bone broth, blah, 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 blah. So we're talking about not just incremental, little better, we're talking about exponential, much bigger effects. And then interestingly, there was a change in the kind of cells that infiltrated less inflammatory cells, neutrophils, and more lymphocytes, immune regulatory lymphocytes. All right. <laughs> now, this was done in humans, too, by the way, and this was corroborated in humans. Now, they went further. If you ever read these studies, they're very interesting. They're very tedious to read, but they're very interesting. They gave the mice an obesogenic diet, okay? A diet designed to make them fat, okay? So, on the left is the con control mouse on an obesogenic obesogenic diet, and after, at the end of his life, after a couple of years, he's, oh, he's, he's overweight, his hair is scraggly, his skin is thin, and he doesn't groom his friends, he just kind of hangs around, right? It's like the old guy watches TV all day. The one, the one on the right was fed lactobacillus roteri, is the same age. Slender, thicker fur, more sebum, more hair, continued to groom his litter mates and play. An old mouse looked and was physiologically younger compared to mice without that species. It gets even better. In the males, so when mice aged, the male's testosterone drops precipitously. And uh, Look what happens when you give them lactobacillus roteri. There's an 800% increase in testosterone. Nothing does that, right? Nothing. I don't mean taking testosterone as a patch or a pill or an injection. I'm talking about a single species of bowel flora. And look what happens. Why does that happen? Because there's an actual increase in, um, you can't tell this from here, testicular side. The testicles get a little bigger. And the Leydig cells that produce testosterone increased. There's a very fundamental change in a male's capacity to generate testosterone. So we all know that guys, as we age, all drop off our testosterone, right? When you were younger, you had levels of 700, 900, 1,000. When you're older, 300, 200, 100, something like that. Here's a way to raise testosterone, if we believe these data. Skin healing did indeed get accelerated dramatically. So on top is what it looks like in a control animal. They induce an injury, and it takes about two weeks to heal. The second one down is with the lactobacillus roteri. Look at day six. Day six in the lactobacillus roteri mice is as good as day 12. Now, we are interested in skin healing, but not only skin healing. This is an index of youthfulness, okay? So what it's looking like is they've induced youthfulness in these mice. And if you look at those, those sections, you can actually, if you take some time to look at it, you'll see that healing is dramatically different. Like before, more collagen, more fibroblasts, less... New, you know what pus is, right? An infected wound. That's what neutrophils do. Less neutrophils, more lymphocytes, more immune-mediating. It changes the whole landscape of healing. It's very, very different. 
it gets even more interesting. <laughs> they looked at the oxytocin levels. When I first thought, I thought, what, what are they looking at oxytocin for? Those of you in healthcare, or those of you moms who had scheduled deliveries of your babies, you remember you got an oxytocin injection, remember that? You say to the, your, your obstetrician, I want to deliver on Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. <laughs> so they give you a big injection of oxytocin, and it induces uterine contraction and cerebral relaxation, and you deliver your child at Tuesday, 8 a.m. or so. But oxytocin is proven to be far more than just a drug you give somebody to induce delivery. Look what happens to oxytocin. It goes sky high. Look what happens to corticosterone. Corticosterone is the mouse equivalent of cortisol. So a lot of you know about cortisol and cortisol problems and the throwing off of the cortisol curves, all that stuff. So cortisol or corticosterone in a mouse drops off dramatically. Abnormally high levels drop off dramatically. The thymus actually increases. Thymus houses immune um, cells. It's part of your immune system. Thymus size and weight actually increases substantially. And then the pus-making neutrophils also drop. So there's a complete change in the landscape of immunity and immune capacity just with this one crazy species. So what does oxytocin do? What would happen if we raised your oxytocin? Now, now let's, we're going to get beyond these mouse data. A lot of this is human data now. Well, uh, I don't know if you know this. Oxytocin is a hormone of love. You, I'm sure you've heard that. But it's so powerful, they're actually giving it during marital counseling <laughs> to encourage empathy for your partner's feelings. Uh, it's being given to kids with autistic spectrum disorder because they have a problem with, with, with engagement, and looking in the eye kind of stuff, and schizophrenics. So they're giving it to people with kids with autism and people with schizophrenia, and they're having some success in generating empathy and engagement. It increases bone density a lot. So this got big pharma, you know those people, all excited. But they don't want to give you oxytocin because they don't care to make only a few hundred million dollars. They try to change it so it can be patent protectable and they can make billions of dollars. So they won't sell you oxytocin. You can get oxytocin, by the way, but you won't get it from a drug company. They don't want to sell you oxytocin. It's too cheap. They want something that can charge you hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of dollars per month. So they're busy making derivatives so they can have Sally Fields and people like that have commercials on TV and sell you this stuff. But you can do this on your own without the interference and the profiteering of big pharma. You lose weight. Mice lose weight, and now we know humans lose weight. The Chinese did a very interesting study. They, now, they gave intranasal oxytocin, so not by lactobacillus reuteri, but intranasal, which you can get, by the way, uh, 24 units four times a day, versus placebo, okay? No change in diet, no change in exercise, nothing. Just say, here, John, take oxytocin, intranasal, uh, or, or I won't tell you what it is, pl pl uh, versus placebo, okay? What happens over two months? Placebo, nothing happens, right? No surprise. Oxytocin, 19.8 pounds lost. Huge. Nothing does that. This is oxytocin intranasal now. I'm, I'm not encouraging you to buy intranasal oxytocin. You can. You can order it from Singapore. <laughs> but without a prescription, I mean. But I think there's a better way to do it. But I'm just telling you that's how this science was done. So extravagant. A big pharma, of course, wants to do this. But they're not going to sell you oxytocin, Right? They don't want pennies, they want billions of dollars. So they're going to come up with a derivative in the coming years, and you'll hear all about it on TV and commercials, right? But you have access potentially to this other strategy to increase your oxytocin. It is an incredibly potent appetite suppressant. Uh, I, it's hard to believe how powerful it is. And it seems to work more the heavier you are. So if you're skinny and don't need to lose weight, you probably won't get much of an anorexogenic effect but it is the most powerful appetite suppressant I have ever come across. So much so, if I, if I had a beautiful big piece of cheesecake for you and you haven't eaten in 12 hours, you'd say, ah, eh, I don't want any. It's that powerful. And that's an oxytocin effect, okay? Oxytocin causes anorexigenic. Not anorexia, but something different. Okay? That's a pathological form. <laughs> it overcomes leptin resistance. You've heard of leptin resistance, right? 
It's one of the reasons why people who gain weight and have type 2 diabetes can't lose weight because they're resistant. Oxytocin circumvents that. It gets beyond it. Increased muscle, we're going to talk about that. Reduced insulin resistance. It changes body composition. Now you know that, at least based on the mouse data and now the human data, there's a dramatic increase in skin thickness and increased collagen. So all you ladies know, right? What happens to skin as we age? You lose collagen, elasticity. That's exactly right. Because collagen is responsible for elasticity. So here we have a way to increase collagen, not by a little bit, <laughs> right, like collagen hydrolysates or, or um, bone broth. We're talking about magnificent increases. Now, humans won't get as much as a mouse. The, the, the phenomena in mice are, are constricted because they live only a couple of years, but, you know, best case scenario. You, I hope you'll live 80, 90, 100, 120 years. So things will happen more slowly in humans, but it, we're seeing this play out in humans. Um, and accelerated healing. I mean, that alone is kind of cool, right? What if you have a, an injury or ha need a surgery, heaven forbid, and your healing time is cut by, let's say, 50, 60, 70%, or you know, something like that? That's pretty, that's pretty cool in and of itself. Now, I was not happy with that, though. And so I got a whole bunch of that species that was used in these studies and had a bunch of people, just, this is just anecdotal, this is informal, taking this probiotic. Not a whole lot happened. So, oh. Well, here's, I think, the problem. And oddly, this species, uh, this strain, is called Lactobacillus ruteri, ATCCPTA6475. <laughs> you, can, you can write that down or take your picture, or it's on my Wheat Belly blog and my undoctored blog, okay? Though it's kind of scattered because I, I, I figured this stuff out piecemeal over months. I didn't one day just wake up and have all the answers. I kind of played around, and so you'll see it scattered around several blog posts. This company, BioGaia, a Swedish company, has oddly a patent on this. I didn't know you could patent biological organisms. I mean, what if I wanted to patent David Wolf? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting idea, but <laughs> I, I think David would have some objections to that. So somehow this company locked up this organism and this strain with, with patents. But look at the numbers in this tablet. These are tablets, by the way. They're hard, chewable tablets. Um, 100 million CFUs. Those of you who deal with probiotics know that's, well, that's a trivial amount, right? That's like yogurt in the supermarket, like nothing in it. And there's the other species, by the way, the other strain, the uh, D, it was D, um, DSM-17938. Um, that was the form used in human studies that accelerated skin healing. So both those strains work. Now, one of the problems we have in probiotics is people are not paying, including the manufacturers, not paying enough attention to strain specificity. Let me tell you what that means. So if we sampled anybody's bowel flora here, you all have E. coli, right? But what happens if you eat some lettuce contaminated from the Central Valley of California by cow manure that has a pathogenic strain of E. coli? What's going to happen to you? You get real sick, right? Diarrhea, and some people die. Kids die sometimes. Now, that's the same species, right? E. coli, different strain, okay? So strain can make a world of difference. So unfortunately, you buy a probiotic, the strains are often not specified. So we've got to get towards this world where we're starting to pay more attention to strains. So you're not taking the wrong strain. For all you know, you're taking a strain that actually causes problems, right? As opposed to a strain that fixes problems. But anyway, so... What we don't know is how broadly other strains of lactobacillus ruteri right, do all this wonderful stuff with oxytocin, skin healing, anti-aging, and stuff. Just don't know. No one's done the data. So what I did was I just accepted we had to stick to these strains, and I wanted bigger counts. How do you amplify bacterial counts? You ferment stuff, right? Now, I'm unhappy with this idea of buying yogurt at the store that's skim, 2% milk, that's all crap. I want high fat yogurt. So I started with uh, half and half, organic half and half, or cream, okay? If you don't want to use dairy, and including the casein beta A1, if you're in Australia or UK or um, New Zealand, you can get beta A2 dairy, or you can use goat or sheep or coconut milk, okay? You can use, there are other ways to do this. Uh, though do know that when you ferment yogurt, the casein beta A1 is partially denatured, broken down. 
it's not gone, it's just reduced, and it may not be as immunogenic. So I'm not, I'm not absolving dairy of all its problems. It's got, the dairy has problems. But you have choices. Could be dairy, could be um, sheep, could be goat, could be coconut milk, okay? Now, I did something additional. Uh, so you, Now, this is my recipe. It doesn't mean this is the right way. It's just the way I did it, but it works. Maybe, you have, maybe you're smarter than me about making yogurt, but I start with a quart of liquid, in this case to start uh, a quart of organic half and half. Now you, wanna you want high counts of organisms. That's what I wanted, right? So I added a prebiotic fiber to the yogurt. I chose inulin. You can use uh, raw potato starch. You can use uh, sugar, sucrose. You can use glucose. You can use any sugar practically, and bacteria love it. Um, I don't know why, but inulin seems to work the best. A fructan polymer, it's a fructose polymer, but it work, seems to work the best. Uh, and then I took 10 tablets of the BioGaia product, crushed it with a mortar and pestle, and then you want to make a slurry first, so put your crushed tablets, then maybe a couple tablespoons of your liquid, your cream or your half and half or your coconut milk, and then your sugar, mix it, and then add the rest of the liquid or else you're going to get concrete from the inulin, okay? So make a slurry first, small volume, and then add the rest of your liquid. And look what you get. Have you ever seen yogurt stand up? That's yogurt. It's more like cream cheese. It's thick and solid. And by the way, tastes far better than any of the nonsense you buy in the supermarket. Certainly far better than non-fat, 1% fat, 2% fat. This, is, this, is, this here is 18% fat because I made it from half and half. And it's delicious, and it's creamy, and it's wonderful. But you can get very good results also with goat's milk, sheep's milk, and coconut milk. If you use coconut milk, by the way, you'll have to add a sugar. Like I'll take maybe, let's say, two cans of uh, uh, non-emulsifying coconut milk and maybe a tablespoon of inulin, a couple of teaspoons of, of sugar, or something like that. Because there's no lactose in coconut milk, so you need more sugars to get the organisms to grow. And then lastly... I don't mean this to become a lesson how to make yogurt, but, but it's so cool when you do this. And then you need to maintain it at more or less 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So some people use a yogurt maker, some people use an Instant Pot, an Instapot, some use a sous vide, some use a rice cooker. I tell you, I have so many appliances in my kitchen, I got sick and tired of having so I just use my oven. Turn the oven on, any temperature, 300, whatever, only for a minute or so. Turn it off but leave your yogurt in there. Don't let the glass vessel overheat. It'll kill everything. And I just do that every four to six hours, and within 36 hours, I have beautiful, delicious yogurt. So you can do that, too. Just got to be careful not to overheat. And don't forget. I've done that, too. Turn the oven on, forget, come back. I got baked yogurt. Don't do that. Um, so it's a very simple process. So I've been having people do this, and I've been absolutely shocked at what they're telling me. The ladies are seeing their wrinkles in the neck go away. I've had a number of ladies with exposed veins. There was one woman who had taken prednisone for a number of years, and she had uh, thin skin and exposed veins. Within three weeks, you couldn't see them anymore. Another uh, woman in her 70s who had senile purpura. You know what that is? Those are those purple blotches you get. And if you, if you just touch somebody, you can get them. And she said every time she cleaned her house, she'd be filled top to bottom with them. Within three weeks, she had zero after a vigorous cleaning of her house. Over and over and over, we're seeing. Now, if you get the skin improvement, collagen enhancing, thicker skin effect, we know that your oxytocin has gone up. We haven't had a chance yet to assess how much in humans. Um, but we're seeing some pretty darn spectacular things. And people are experiencing so much disinterest in eating that people who like to fast, intermittently fast, it makes it absolutely effortless. So if you want to fast, for instance, to reverse fatty liver, or you want to accelerate getting off insulin for your type 2 diabetes, or you want to break a weight loss plateau, or whatever, for whatever reason, you can use this yogurt to achieve those effects faster, more comfortably. The dose, you know, one thing we've not done is quantify the counts. We don't have the means to do that yet. There's no lab. I don't have a lab in my kitchen. But it looks like you have to consume about a half a cup to get these effects. It seems to be very consistent. 
consume a half cup. And you do have to ferment, by the way, if it's dairy, about 36 hours. If it's, if it's coconut milk, it takes 48 plus hours. Don't let it ferment too long. You'll get fungus contamination. You don't want that. If you do, you just skip it off. You have to throw it away. But I've been shocked at the magnitude of effect we're seeing that was initially seen in mice, corroborated to some degree in humans, and now we're seeing this play out with no ill effects. By the way, the uh, oxytocin has no known toxicities. Even that Chinese study they gave 24 units intranasal four times a day, it's a almost 100 units, right? So we're talking about mega doses. No side effects were observed. We're not getting <laughs> that kind of levels here. But this is a really cool workaround to get a lot of the benefits of oxytocin. Bone density increase, testosterone increase in guys. The ladies get a rise in estrogen, by the way, but it's not clear yet how big that is. The only people who shouldn't do this are pregnant moms, because you don't want to stimulate uterine contraction. It's not quite clear if it would or not, but you don't want to be playing with that. Uh, but like ladies who don't have men who are like menopausal or don't have or not pregnant, and guys, of course, can do this. It's it's a very harmless thing. But it is a very, very interesting, fascinating, and powerful tool. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, let's talk about, I'm sorry, the, somehow the slides when I transferred from Keynote to PowerPoint got corrupted, but they're supposed to say muscle. Let's talk about muscle. And this interfaces with the uh, oxytocin conversation. So you all know that as we age, we lose muscle, right? We all know that. So the older lady compared to the younger lady has probably about 35, 40% less muscle. And if she's yo-yo dieted over the years, even more, up to 50% less muscle than her younger, uh, her granddaughter. Why is that? Well, when you lose, let's say you lose weight. Let's say you lose 50 pounds. Maybe you did Adkins, ketogenic diet, whatever. You lose 50 pounds. How much was muscle? About 15 to 18 pounds was actually muscle. About 30% of weight loss tends to be muscle, depending on what diet you used. Well, you know what happens, right? People go off the diet, they regain the 50 pounds. They didn't regain the muscle, they only regained fat. Okay, so when they regained all that weight, it was all fat. So now they're worse off. It's harder to lose weight. You're even more resistant to insulin. Okay, that's very common, right? When you get to age 70 or so, you have... 50% or less muscle than you had when you were younger because, partly because of that effect. And that, why does it occur? Well, inflammation. Inflammation is a huge degradative factor in muscle loss. Dysbiosis, changes in bowel flora, reduced physical activity, not working outside, not doing physical work as much. Vitamin D deficiency contributes to muscle loss. And then reduction or loss of the trophic hormones, hormones that cause muscle growth. But in that list of essential hormones to maintain muscle, our old friend, oxytocin. Now, I love this. I love when there's no medical treatment for something. <laughs> Unfortunately, my colleagues will say, oh, Mary, there is no treatment for fatty liver. Nothing. There's no drug, no procedure. We'll watch you when you go into cirrhosis, and then liver failure will get you a liver transplant. That's, that's the medical solution to fatty liver. But you can reverse it with change in diet in a week. Really, it's so damn simple. So if somebody says, there's no medical treatment, what you should hear, I don't have drugs or revenue-producing procedures for you. <laughs> Look for your own solutions, okay? Be undoctored, I would say. So sarcopenia is loss of muscle, okay? So there's, there's no medical treatment for sarcopenia. That's good news. Who wants some stinking drug for $3,000 a month to make your muscle grow, right? So what happens when you build back more youthful quantities of muscle? Well, good stuff happens. It's easy to control weight, particularly in visceral fat. Blood sugar, sensitization to insulin. You're less diabetes, less pre-diabetes prone, and all, uh, 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 more likely to be free of all the problems of high insulin. You're just more flexible. You don't fall as much. You're more agile. As young people are, your bone density goes up because it often it parallels muscle mass. So it doesn't necessarily mean Boniva and Fosamax. It can just mean a little bit of building muscle back uh, with oxytocin too, right? And then you also look and feel better. Now, this, 
This is a largely an oxytocin question again, though. And it, this, this observation that oxytocin is instrumental for muscle came from a very weird set of experiments from UC Berkeley. <laughs> Wouldn't you know? They took two genetically compatible mice and intermingled their bloodstreams. Creepy, right? And what happened? One mouse is old, one mouse is young. The old mouse gets young. Creepy, but kind of cool. And it was found to be largely, not entirely, but largely due to oxytocin. The higher levels of oxytocin in the young mouse. Now, most of you don't want to be stitched together with somebody, right? I asked David Wolf if he'd be my stitch partner. He, said, he just he turned me down. I'm... Look what happens to muscle. Young muscle, lots of muscle fibers. Older muscle, loss of muscle fibers. Add oxytocin back, it's young again. You have more youthful restoration of muscle. So what can you do to increase muscle and maintain youthful muscularity over the years? Well, once again, we're back to that old thing. Do the basics first, right? No grains, no sugars, because that reduces inflammation dramatically. If you track C-reactive protein, a measure of inflammation, from a grain eater to non-grain, you'll see it drop from 4 or 5 milligrams per deciliter to 0 in no time. You don't need stinking lipid, uh, Crestor to do that. That's what the doctor tells you, the Jupiter trial. You need Crestor to reduce your C-reactive protein. That's nonsense. Vitamin D is a trophic hormone. It causes muscle growth. It's also anti-inflammatory. And then lastly, cultivation of bowel flora. Big anti-inflammatory strategy. So all those things help grow muscle. It's probably part of the reason why people on the program I use, they say, I haven't lost any weight on your program. But my waist is three inches smaller. My thighs are two inches smaller. I, I'm physiologically better. My blood sugar has dropped, et cetera. But I haven't lost weight because some people are more sensitive to this effect. They get more muscle out of it. But there's more you can do to build back muscle. And a lot of you who do strength training know these things, right? Strength training, of course, creatine, hydroxymethylbutyrate probably works. Once again, oxytocin. Oxytocin shows its head once again as a very cool way to augment your muscle growth. How do you do that? Well, you could get the intranasal oxytocin, or you could just do what we've been doing, and that is make some yogurt using lactobacillus rotori, ATCC, PTA 6475, or DSM-17938. <laughs> All right. Let's switch gears now. Let's talk about cognitive preservation. Trying to keep you from wetting your pants and forgetting how to drive home at age 70 or whatever, okay? Dementia, right? And it's becoming very common. It's becoming very common because we have an unhealthy population with lots of inflammation, other factors. So, and you can see this. You can do an MRI or the CAT scan of the brain. You can see a shrunken brain, especially of the hippocampus. The hippocampus, two little hippocampi, right and left, part of the uh, brain. And that's the part of the brain that is responsible for converting short-term memory to long-term memory. Okay? So that's why people with dementia, Alzheimer's, can't remember what they ate for breakfast, but remember where they went to school 60 years earlier. It's because the hippocampus is impaired and can't convert short-term, near-term memory to long-term memory. And you can see that on MRIs, volumetric MRI, CAT scan, etc. So, now we, we only have time to cover a little bit of this, but I want to emphasize one thing. When it comes to, when you embark on a program of preserving brain health, there's a lot of BS out there. Right? There's those supplements uh, advertised on TV that preserve cognition. Here's a very, very important concept when it comes to preserving cognition. The difference between a nootropic and a neurotrophic. Bear with me. Anybody here play with nootropics? Yeah, a bunch of you do. What does that mean? It means they take supplements, supplements, or even drugs like vinpocetine, paracetam, aniracetam, pramiracetam, dimethylenoethanol, various acetylcholine derivatives, huperzine. There's all these supplements you can take that, like paracetam, very benign, it raises your IQ about 10 points for about four hours. <laughs> and then you're as dumb as you were before. <laughs> okay? So that's a nootropic. It makes you smarter briefly. 
Interestingly, so there are many effective nootropics, right? I, I love vimpocetine, Parastatin, for instance. Uh, it doesn't make you healthier, it just makes you a little smarter, a little more creative, better able to recall lists of information, better able to synthesize data, put things, can make connections for about four hours. But your brain is no healthier. The prescription drugs for dementia are all, at best, lousy nootropics. That does not stop them from charging you $700 a month for one drug, over $1,000 a month for several drugs. For relatively weak and lousy nootropics, they never tell you this doesn't make you actually healthier. So that's, those are nootropics, okay? A neurotrophic changes your brain's biochemistry and anatomy. For instance, it'll increase the number of brain cells, neuronal cells. It'll increase the richness of dendritic connections or synaptic connections. These are the connections between brain cells that mediate thought, memory, okay? It increases the density. It increases BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So these are neurotrophic, because these make your brain healthier. That's what we really want. We don't, taking nootropics is fine, it's fun. But you don't, you don't take, say, vinpocetine and think you're somehow protected from dementia. So likewise, all those supplements you're told to, to buy for brain health are nootropics, if they're nootropic at all. They're certainly not neurotrophic, okay? So I tell you that because it'll help you understand in future all the hype and what's truth in this idea of cognitive preservation. So how do you start in a program of, de of pre preventing dementia? Once again, forgive me, the basic stuff, right? No grains, no sugars, because that's massively anti-inflammatory. We know that with good confidence, inflammation and insulin resistance uh, drives dementia. You've heard dementia is called um, type 3 diabetes, right? So the basic stuff. Fish oil, you know, of, there's a lot of data on what works in dementia prevention, but one of the most thoroughly studied and most effective dementia preventing agents, omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Not linolenic acid, okay? Linolenic acid can be, you know what I'm talking about, right? The omega-3 from flaxseed, chia, etc is beneficial for brain health, but not, it cannot replace EPA, DHA. There's no replacement for the EPA and DHA from fish oil, including krill. Because krill has a trivial quantity. It's a phospholipid form, but it's a trivial quantity. You cannot do this with krill. It's got, you have a choice. Fish oil capsules and fish consumption, or the brains of animals. Take your choice. Most people choose fish oil. Uh, iodine, thyroid status, is also very important preservation, and thyroid dysfunction, hypothyroidism, is everywhere. Look for it, you'll find it, it's everywhere. And then lastly, the cultivation of bowel flora, that's gonna be a big, big, I don't have a lactobacillus roideri type conversation for this yet, but I think you're gonna find out that dementia is largely a condition of dysbiosis. And in coming months and years, we'll start talking about what specific steps we can take to prevent cognitive decline. This is proven to be a very powerful in that connection, the connection between bowel flora and brain health, whether it's Parkinsonism, Lou Gehrig's disease, or dementia. But there's more you can do. Not allowing insulin resistance to occur and raising blood ketones in some way. How do you, you guys know what ketones are, right? You can be on a ketogenic diet, Though, by the way, that's a whole other conversation. Ketogenic diets, I, I have some reservations about because there's some issues with ketogenic diets if they're done for a long period, like kidney stones and colon cancer, et cetera. So I think ketosis is wonderful if done intermittently. But what, when you're in ketosis, that is, you're either calorically deprived or carbohydrate deprived, your blood ketones go up, beta hydroxybutyrate, et cetera. Well, another way to do this is to take medium chain triglycerides, either as the oil or as MCT oil powder, okay, which is a great coffee creamer, by the way. And you raise blood ketones a little bit. Another way it's becoming possible is to actually take beta-hydroxybutyrate. But be, be, be very careful with that. Take a look at my blog post, because some of the companies, including a San Diego company, came out with, with powdered beta-hydroxybutyrate that had fatal levels of potassium in it. Okay, so read my blog before you buy anything. If you're eager to do this, the perfect keto product, that's a brand, is among the best. I have no relationship, no reason. To, I'm, not, I'm telling you because it's a good product. 
Just be careful. But the point here is, if you raise blood ketones, we know with confidence, because there's now studies showing us, that there's greater clarity. People will remember things if they have dementia or cognitive impairment. What's not clear is whether there's a neurotrophic effect of, of ketones. So that still is, is open to debate. Exercise is clearly neurotrophic. We now have studies that show that by MRI, the hippocampus gets a little bit larger. Uh, it's quite powerful. Uh, choose your exercise. It doesn't have to be marathons. It could be dancing. It could be the rumba. It could be Zumba. It could be gardening, whatever. Take your choice of being physically active. That is clearly shown to be neurotrophic. Estrogens. You know, we, uh, I don't want to drone on too long, but, you know, Premarin did us no favor. You guys know that, right? Horse estrogens. Why were nice ladies given horse estrogens? Imagine a nice young man comes to me and says, Doc, I think I have low testosterone. I say, I got the thing for you, John. Frog testosterone. He'd say, what? Why? Can't I just get human testosterone? Why did we give nice human females horse estrogens that look nothing like human estrogen? Is it because it was proven to be superior? Patent protectable. More money. So all the data came out eventually, right? Premarin is not protective. It actually causes heart disease. It causes dementia. It causes endometrial cancer. It causes breast cancer. So that put a damper on all conversations about estrogens. Well, thankfully now, it's becoming clear human estrogen doesn't do that stuff. Horse estrogen does, but not human estrogen. So there's this whole notion of taking estrogens, at least for a period after menopause, uh, is coming back. And that may be an important strategy for uh, preventing dementia. But after age 60, it you've probably lost that, that window of opportunity. That, that, that has to be explored further, but it's, it's starting to go in that direction. Um, DHEA probably does have a neurotrophic effect if you have high cortisol, okay? And then getting your cortisol down. You know what cortisol, high, high cortisol states are, right? Stress, divorce, financial ruin. These are all high cortisol states. So, so people who've had a financial uh, uh, tragedy or a divorce are much more prone to d dementia. Uh, sleep deprivation, chronic sleep deprivation is a high cortisol because cortisol causes brain and hippocampal shrinkage, atrophy. Okay? So being aware that cortisol, not an easy thing to deal with, right? If you're going through a divorce, there's no cure, but getting beyond it, but be aware that these kinds of things raise cortisol and thereby contribute to eventual dementia. And a wacky plug for transcranial. Anybody do transcranial direct current stimulation? I'd be very impressed if you did. I thought it was nuts. It's not. It works. And there are preliminary data suggesting a neurotrophic effect. All it is, is anode cathode, for those of you who are engineers or electricians, you pass a current, comes from a 9-volt battery, no joke. Don't, don't use a 9-volt battery. You need a device to, to, to <laughs> modulate current. And depending where you put it, it amplifies brain tissue growth. It increases BDNF. And you get a neuro... Now this is a really hot topic in people with dementia or early cognitive decline or at risk for it. And we're starting to see partial reversal. So it's something to just be aware of. I have a device. It's kind of fun to play with. It's kind of wacky. But, uh, uh, but I tell you all this to tie up uh, because there's a new study in town. You've been told, right? Learn a new language, it'll prevent dementia. Um, learn a new musical instrument, it'll prevent dementia. Is that true? Is that true? Well, there's a very important trial to know about called the ACTIVE study. Very quickly, big study. Almost 3,000 people followed for 10 years uh, but, but normal cognition at the start, they were given cognitive training sessions okay, of three different kinds. Memory exercises, memorize this list, that kind of stuff. Reasoning exercises, solve this puzzle. Or speed of processing exercises, go faster and faster and faster, accomplishing some task. Okay? Now, speed of processing has already been shown to improve driving. You ever notice... So you're, you're, you're going down the road, speed limit's 40 miles an hour, and there's a car doing 20 or 25. And you're getting pissed off, like, ha, ha, right? Flash your lights until you notice it's this poor woman who's probably somebody's great-grandmother. You say, oh, jeez, right? Now, think about this. If she has a 40- or 50-year track record of driving, 
shouldn't she be the one zipping down the road at high speed, weaving in and out of traffic, responding, right? She should be the best driver on the road. Why isn't she? Why does she make you get mad and honk and have road rage? Because she's lost her speed of processing, okay? Okay. So in this study, the active trial of 2,800 people, they used a piece of software called uh, Brain HQ. It's very crude, but this is the software that was used. You can, you, you can buy it yourself online, like 14 bucks a month. You can subscribe to it. And all they do is they take a picture like this, a cartoonish picture, and flash it real quick, split second, and you have to tell them wh which car was it and where was the sign. That's, that's the exercise. And you do this over and over and over again. It goes faster and faster and faster. There's another one where you, there's like a circle of birds, cartoon birds. You have to pick the one that's different. One is red, not blue, has a bigger beak, whatever, something like that. That's all Brain HQ was. But these, this is how they encourage speed of processing, faster and faster and faster, looking at these crazy pictures. And speed of processing on top went up. But here's the thing to notice. So they gave these people these exercises day one, end of year one, end of year three, okay, and then stopped. But look what happened to the speed of processing. It took 10 years to come back to normal. In other words, those little exercises of looking at the birds or the cars changed brain function for a decade, even though it was a handful of sessions over three years. It lasted. Interestingly, the memory exercises did not have any kind of durable effect. The reasoning exercise did not have any kind of durable effect. Only the speed of processing did. And they tracked these people. The people who engaged in speed of processing exercises had a relative drop in dementia risk of 29%. And the people who engaged most in the exercises, who, who were best at attending the sessions, et cetera, had a 41% reduction in the incidence of dementia. That's pretty powerful from playing a stupid computer game, right? So I got me thinking, whoops. Um, do you have to buy that? Pro you could buy that program. That's the one that was uh, validated in, 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 a, in, a, in a study. But what involves speed of processing, making you go faster and faster and faster? What involves multiple simultaneous sensory inputs, right? Like those little cartoonish things did and is something you can do. <laughs> right? Play Pac-Man. Now, it could be Call of Duty Black Ops 3 like I play, <laughs> but I doubt most of you <laughs> folks want to play uh, those kinds of hardcore video games. My, my point is this. It does not have to be a fancy piece of brain software. It could be something simple. It could be dancing. It could be tennis. But it's clearly this, this old saw you've heard, learn a new language, memorize things. It's probably not. If you learn a new language, you're better at that language and learning other languages. If you do Sudoku, you're better at Sudoku. If you do crossword puzzles, you're better at crossword puzzles but it doesn't cut the eventual development of dementia, okay? So we're talking about not just enhancing a specific task performance, but actually reducing the likelihood of dementia. So speed of processing is the key here. And, you know, one of the things I've gotten involved with is that we're developing a program in New Jersey. It's a, it's a residential program, but assisted living, retirement kind of place. But we're trying to get people who are either at risk or have cognitive impairment or early dementia, and we're going to try to reverse it or, or stop it at least by doing all these kinds of things. No grains, no sugars, vitamin D, fish oil, uh, cultivation of bowel flora, some of the supplements you can use, um, MCTs, exogenous beta-hydroxybutyrate, ketones, exercise, etc. and we're going to put in Pac-Man consoles. <laughs> I bought a Pac-Man thing you could hook into your TV for my kids when they were small. My kids are big now. Uh, I think it cost me 19 bucks. 19 bucks, you plug it into your digital TV and you can play Pac-Man or Ms. Pac-Man or Pac-Man Jr. or Galaga or Galaxian. I, I, I picked those games only because a lot of us, uh, I doubt you ladies want to play fancy video games. But this is one way of engaging speed of processing that's not just effective, probably, but fun. It's fun, right? All right. So, so I, I took you down some paths that I, I think you may have found unexpected. But it's all part of my mission, which is not to... So I, I practiced cardiology for 25 years. 
and I'm embarrassed at the things I did. Telling people to have angioplasty and rotoblader and atherectomy and bypass surgery and you need Lipitor, all that nonsense. No, you can have magnificent control and the truth of it is, the health you obtain, particularly people like you who are really engaged in health and hearing all kinds of cutting edge conversations, I really mean this, the health you get is dramatically superior to the health the doctor gives you. Because the doctor is interested in drugs, prescription drugs, and procedures, and other revenue-generating processes. Health is no longer part of the equation. Health care, there's no health in health care, like there's no grape and grape nuts, right? <laughs> but, but I really mean it. The health you guys achieve on your own, what I say is undoctored, is not just almost as good as, it's not trying to match what the doctor does, it is dramatically superior to what you get from the doctor's office or the hospital. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for Dr. William Davis. Thank you. Okay, we have time for two burning questions that apply to everyone in the audience. Not something specific to you, what's going on with your health, but two questions that apply to everyone in the audience so everybody benefits. Uh, young man in front? We're waiting for a microphone, right? <laughs> um, with the oxytocin, it's a hormone, correct? Yes. So um, with the two probiotics you said to ferment, do those, as a result, create the hormone oxytocin? No. It, you know, it, if... If you have time, read those studies. They're, they're a pain in the, 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 the neck to read. But you'll see, I'm, I'm really whittling down the science. They did an extraordinary job of deciphering the mechanism. And it's a, it's, it's a vagal, it's a vagal mechanism. With the, you know, the vagus nerve. Uh -huh. If you cut the vagus nerve, you don't get these benefits. Really weird, right? And it's exerted via the hypothalamus in the brain. So what's happening is somehow, you take this organism, and it, via the vagus nerve, it causes your hypothalamus to release its oxytocin. It also changes the behavior of immune-mediating lymphocytes. So there's something very complex here that no one really understands fully, but it's a very, very potent effect. But when, it, when you say hormone, don't, don't hear, you know, estrogen. You know, vitamin D is a hormone, right? Young lady, do you have the... Uh... Oh, hang on for the mic. We're going to bring you a mic. There you go. You said we need iodine. There's all kinds of iodine, Lugol's iodine, iodine from all over. How much iodine and what kind of iodine do we need? Good question. I agonized over this for a long time because there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of lack of information on iodine. So whenever in doubt, I always say, how did natural humans do it, right? So in Japan, where they're coastal and eat a lot of seafood, how much iodine do they get? About 3,300 micrograms per day, though it varies widely, depending on whether you're a fisherman or a businessman, right? Um, how about the people on the island of Hokkaido? Northern Japan. They get 20,000 to 30,000 micrograms per day, and they get iodine toxicity all the time, which is hypothyroidism, okay? One form of iodine toxicity is hypo... It turns off your thyroid. So that and other observations tell us, oh yeah, you can get very toxic in iodine if you take these mega doses, because I know that some people do that. And I've seen it happen over and over again. People take these Lugol solution, which is concentrated iodine, and they turn their thyroid off, which is bad. I had a very nice dietitian once come to me. She's very smart, but she decided to take iodorol, 12.5 milligrams of a mixed iodine form. And she didn't understand why she gained 18, she's wonderfully healthy. She gained 18 pounds, she had leg edema, she was cold, she was tired, hair's falling out in clumps, 
and her TSH was 18. <laughs> uh, she had hypothyroidism. So we got to pay attention to how we're doing iodine. I'll tell you how I do it. Not to say I have the final word, but after agonizing over this, talking to iodine experts, it's thinking about the data, et cetera, this is what I do. Take kelp. Because kelp is a mixture of iodine forms. It has sodium iodide, potassium iodide, uh, iodinated proteins, I2, molecular iodine, and some others. Because how do we know which form is best? Because iodine occurs as mixed forms in food and seafood. So I've gone to the kelp, the mixed form. You can take, though, with good results, potassium iodide drops. You can do that, too. But I would not take Lugol's nor Iodorol or other high-potency iodines, because all it takes is a few weeks to months of too much iodine, and your TSH goes sky high, and you won't understand why your hair is falling out, you're gaining weight, and your cholesterol goes sky high, and you're tired all the time. That's hypothyroidism from too much iodine. It's very common. I know there's a conversation about megadose iodine. I know that. We don't have time to get into that. But I think what he's doing is treating SIBO with megadose iodine. Because I, when you were a kid, right? You fell down, skin your knee, what did mom put on your knee? Iodine. It's antibacterial, right? So what happened? You take megadose iodine, you wipe out bowel flora, particularly upper region bowel flora, as in SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. By the way, we don't have time to cover this. Maybe somebody will in this, in this conference. But SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, huge topic. Huge and very powerful topic. Not all the answers are, are, are out there yet, but... I was guilty of having underestimated just how many people have this problem. But anyway, I think that some people are seeing apparent benefits of, of megadose iodine are really just treating SIBO and seeing extravagant benefits. But we need cl clarification on that issue. Okay, maybe one more. One more? Maybe we should go someplace else, huh? Yeah. Have you come across any of that research in dementia with um, people doing yoga? So memorizing the poses, doing the asanas, moving quickly, thinking. To, Does that come in your world? To my knowledge, now forgive me, I'm going to bore you silly for a moment. Yeah. There's, and th but this is important because you'll see the news screws it up all the time. There's two different kinds, general kinds of data in, in health, and medicine, etc. Observational data and treatment blinded data. Okay? You say, ah, oh, think of it. Prem, why did Premarin become so popular? Because I would say, Mary, do you take Premarin? No, I don't. Kay, do you take Premarin? Yes, I do. And then we tracked those ladies, thousands of them, over five years. And that's called observational data. What did that data show in Premarin? It showed that Premarin, suggests that Premarin reduced endometrial cancer, reduced breast cancer, reduced cardiovascular disease and dementia. Then the real data was developed, where I say, Mary, take this tablet. I don't know what it is, and you won't know what it is until five years later. That data showed the exact opposite. It showed that Premarin increased endometrial cancer, increased breast cancer, increased dementia, increased cardiovascular death. Okay? In other words, you'll see this over and over and over again. The observational data is almost like no data at all. And so all the arguments like learn a new language, that's observational data. It might be true, but you can't tell that from observational data. Does that make sense? Okay. So the, the yoga data is observational. It doesn't mean yoga's bad. It just means before you can claim that yoga reduces dementia, someone needs to do this. All right. All you people don't do yoga, and you thousands of people do yoga, and then we track you for 10 years and see who has more dementia. As you can imagine, it's almost impossible. That's why people use observational data, because it's much cheaper, it's easy, it's almost free. But the problem is it leads to awful, sometimes scandalous, outcomes like, like Premarin, right? So please, let's give it up one more time for Dr. William Davis. Thank you. Thank you.